First Corinthians is where we're going to go to start the message. Chapter 1, verses 26, all the way to 31. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no human being, no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you're in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. If we don't learn anything else but this today, or if we're just reminded of merely a, a single truth, I hope it's this. Let it be this. God uses people to achieve his purposes. And as risky as that is, and, you, and we all know because we know ourselves, it's pretty risky. Uh, if we were God, I'm not so sure we would choose ourselves. You know, I wouldn't, if I was God, I'm not choosing Jerry. You know, so as risky as that is, God uses men, women, and children in partnership to carry out his plan. Yes, he does work in spite or despite of us and outside of us, but primarily throughout Scripture, he uses human beings to work in and through, flawed, imperfect as we are. What a risky thing to do. The elaboration then of this reality comes in the form of our message this morning. So, so since God uses people, who are they? Who are God's partners? And we just heard a pretty good definition of that. As a matter of his preference, and I'm not defending this or explaining why, but as a matter of his preference, God uses a lot of people to change the world that do not measure up to the standards set up by the world or set up by society in our culture that define success, power, and strength. We are considering a passage then here that's part of a context where Paul is dealing with the wisdom of the world versus the marvelous wisdom of God, which is often mistaken by the world as being silly or foolish or sometimes even stupid. And if you haven't read things lately or watched the news lately, uh, that's confirmed. We're considered to be not so with it, not so politically correct, or we're considered to be intolerant. I mean, all these things. Uh, but Scripture talks about this. The similarity of these Corinthians and today's America is startling because they were as we are now. The wisdom of the world was exalted above everything else. Uh, I call it faux knowledge, you know, fake knowledge, uh, because that's all we seem to pursue anymore. It's all about uh, a greater knowledge. And we, here we are, the, the custom of philosophizing about anything and everything and uh, is not only in the world, it's penetrated the church. You even hear it in the topics that are preached and, and the subjects that are brought forth. It's very little to do with the cross or the blood or, or remission of sins or, or, or the resurrection of Christ. It's all about you know, self-improvement, this, that, and the other thing. It's philosophizing. It's penetrated the church. And so because of that, the church is divided into various factions. The absolutes are being ignored. And just like they were uh, in the Corinthians, uh, they were ignoring the absolutes. And, and if you think about that, it's like a modern-day dilemma. You know, here it is thousands of years ago in the Bible, and here it is today. They, they were as we are. Uh, you would think after all that time, something would improve with us, wouldn't you? But it just keeps repeating. But instead of God, then, instead of following God, a certain men are followed. And we see evidence of that all around us. Certain men followed instead of God, quarreling and, and boasting and uh, dividing, glorying in man's or human being's ability rather than glorying in God and generally elevating the insight and perceived wisdom of men and women instead of God. How did the Lord deal with that then? How does he deal with it now? As God so many times does, uh, he gives, us a, gives a simple contrast uh, with the Corinthians themselves being the subject of that contrast. In other words, he uses us to teach us about us. 
The Holy Spirit speaks through Paul here and says, look at yourselves, evaluate your own call. Look what has happened in your own life. And as they did that then and as we do that now, there's some very important facts that we cannot overlook. It, it is repeated over and over again in Scripture, not many of you. Even the concept Jesus taught, not narrow road, not many of you. Not many of you what then? When God called you to salvation and then you accepted, uh, uh, there were not many of you by human standards who were wise or influential. Not many of you uh, were born of nobility. In fact, I don't know anybody here that was born of nobility. You're not many of you. Not many. Fortunately, God in his wisdom did not say through Paul, not any of you. He said, not many of you. Our salvation then is engraved with the letter M. Without that letter, it's not any. Instead, M, not many. Let's take a closer look at not many in Corinth. I dug up a little bit. There were a few who had some standing in the community in that church. I could only find four in my research. There were Sothenes and Crispus. Sothenes and Crispus. These men had, had once been rulers of the synagogue and more than likely had a, a lot of social standing. They were highly regarded in their community. They had these upstanding reputations. And there was also Erastus, who was the city treasurer. There was also Gaius, who was evidently a wealthy businessman. And that's it. I couldn't find any other references that point to any other people in the fellowship at Corinth Corinth that were prominent or had status. The words of Paul, not many are literal in this passage. Not hypothetical, they're literal. Most of the people there were common, ordinary, as we say, good old boys uh, and good old girls, people of the city, just regular people. The world really did regard them as somewhat foolish. Religion, really? That's for weak people. That's for stupid people. That's for uneducated people, poor people, the low of the low. Many of them were slaves in, at that church, probably unknown, plain, just simple people. They were pretty much like we are, no political, no uh, military, <coughs> excuse me, no social clout whatsoever, just a few. There were not many people of influence in that body, and they had very little contacts with what we call the upper class. Uh, they were without much power then to affect the life around them. They, they are us. We are them. And the wonderful truth about that is this. It is God's choice. That's what God chooses. The little people of the world, the foolish, the weak, the lowly, the despised, God even chooses the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Think about your life, if you can at all. God has used the things that are not to nullify the things that are. If you're feeling that nobody recognizes you, if you're watching, you feel like you just got, uh, you're unimportant and you're obscure and your life doesn't matter, you don't make an impression on anyone or anything, you should rejoice because if you're born again, uh, then, then it's not because of, of earthly power and influence that, that God wants to use you. It's because you're in the status you are that God is going to use you if you you let him. Most of the time, and I qualify that word most of the time, God himself takes delight in setting aside the impressive things of humanity most of the time. And, and if you see that in other people's lives and your own, you'll see that, yeah, that's true. He sets that stuff aside. We want to push it out front and use it. God sets it aside and surprises us and hits us, as Bob and I talk about, backdoor revival. We got the front door open thinking revival's coming this way. God says, no, I'm coming in the east door. I'm coming in the West door. And as I've, I've alluded to many, many times, this does not mean that God doesn't use people of social status and stature. He does. However... Remarkably enough, only those of us who have learned that our usefulness does not derive from our position or our abilities, but rather comes from his presence in our lives. That's when he uses anybody and everybody when we let go. It's not about us being able to uh, produce good music. Remember we talk about, you can get that on the radio. You can, you can buy it, well, I don't know if you can get jukeboxes anymore, they're probably all digital, but... Uh, it's not about that. 
And, you know, don't you think it's insane that we think so highly of the wisdom of the world and God thinks so little of it? Hey, he really does. Isn't that strange how we put so much value in what, what we think uh, resources and, and, and society can do? And God just thinks so little of that. It means so very, very little to him. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 16, 15. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. We got it backwards in the way we live sometimes. We got it backwards. Everything that the Holy Spirit writes through Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 seems to flow from this fact in the, in the book of Luke. It's detestable to God. God obviously works in different ways than what we do. And what humans put great importance on and emphasize as necessary is most of the time totally set aside by God. Think about the life of Jesus and what you know about him. What did he, he there's no way he followed the cultural norms. I mean, he upset so many of them. What they do? They ended up crucifying him. God sets all that aside. He works in different ways, and he doesn't like what we do half the time. I think. In fact, it, in fact, I think sometimes it's an outrage to him. But we often quote Zechariah, and we say, "Not by might, uh, not by power, but by His Spirit." But our life actually reflects that we rely on so many other things. We look to so many other things for the might or the power that we need to operate. And as the corporate body of Jesus Christ, we act as though our influence is going to depend on our technique or the program that we initiate. Nothing wrong with techniques or programs, but we do sometimes act as though our influence depends on those things. We act as though numbers and, and largeness are, are something that will prove to be the most effective. We act as though we have forgotten that God has done most of his miraculous work in history, in the history of his church, through remnants. And they weren't, you know, well sewn together remnants, speaking metaphorically. They were a mess. Read about your favorite heroes in the Bible. They were a mess. Some of the things they did, we would never think of doing. But God, in his mercy, infinite mercy, and his undescribable grace, uses people messed up people and we forget that god and he uses remnants it's always a small remnant bigness huge crowds are not necessarily what it takes to shake up the world or provide or produce a spiritual awakening it's not a huge crowd that does that history proves that it starts with a small remnant one or two people and then that turns to five then that turns. it's always a remnant with god numbers are the byproduct of the result of a spiritual awakening but numbers in and of itself do not guarantee in and of themselves do not guarantee the influence of the spirit of god and we've got we've got that backwards it's great to grow but it's only great to grow if and when god makes it happen not manipulated through programs or techniques or or whatever it is you need to do to get people another point in reference to our perception is what is important is a concept that visibly reflects in some of our actions in the body of christ a concept which displays that nothing can happen unless we have the resources first to make it happen and so we have it backwards we, we think resources need to come first if we could only get the resources then we can start a great ministry if we, we could only get the resources we could start a church uh, and that's the reversal of god's position on the matter in scripture we you don't begin with resources you begin with ministry you begin with obeying what god is telling you to do uh, all of us are priests and I know that's, that seems like a heavy-duty responsibility, but every one of us, if you're born again, you are a priest. You are a minister. All of us are ministers of the gospel. Every one of us. This is the glory of this organism we call the body of Christ, this living organism. God puts each and every one of us into ministry of some kind. You may not be aware of that, but you need to be aware. We are all a tool of God, God's tools. I may be a hammer, you may be a screwdriver, but we are all all tools in one way or another if you begin to do what God wants you to do right where you are in life if you will just allow him let him start to work through you like he wants to do then all the resources you need all the resources that are necessary will come and I'm talking to somebody specific I guess because of the emphasis um, ministry resource follows ministry. Ministry doesn't follow resource. How far then have we drifted from God's viewpoint on things? 
every day I identify more in my own life. The closer you get, the further away you feel like you are. You know, there's always something. But I personally believe that God makes us, with, make, make sure with us, every generation proving over and over again that we are given to understand this great principle that Paul discloses. The Lord deliberately chooses the weak and the obscure and uses them in great power to remind us that it is not status, it's not prestige, it's not numbers, largeness, or resources that make ministry for God effective. Uh, and when I say resources, that, that's a generic term for what America calls money. But that's such a limited, resources go well beyond money. You know, some of us don't understand that a resource is time. And if we donate our time, uh, that's a resource. You see what I mean? Some of us don't understand that, but it's well beyond money. So resources, uh, that God makes ministry effective, not resource. God makes everything effective. We've got to remember how Jesus put it in Matthew eleven twenty five 25 and Luke 10, 21. I praise you, Father, that you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. God chooses, the mouth, God chooses and uses the mouths of children and the mouths of the unimportant to oftentimes do what the adults and the important cannot do or, or will not do or cannot or will not allow to happen. We've experienced that in our lives if we paid attention. One of the greatest spiritual awakenings in our recent world history started in the 19th century over in England. One of our, America's, one of our backwoods preachers, uh, <laughs> that's what they called him. I don't know if that term's still used, but backwoods American preacher. He went over there to preach at Cambridge University. His name was D.L. Moody. I hope you know that name, but, but man, he caused a lot of commotion. D.L. Moody. The entire university was literally outraged at this hick. From the United, they were protesting even. This hick from the United States would dare appear and come to speak to us, come to speak to the center of culture of the English world. I mean, they were just really mad about it. All of them knew he murdered the king's English, which was bad enough, you know, but they had also heard he was the only human being who could ever pronounce Jerusalem in one syllable. So many of the professors, that was the rumor, so many of the professors and students there agreed, they got together and agreed that when Moody would get up to speak and after he got going uh, in the chapel at Cambridge University, they would boo and shout, make whatever noise they could until he left the platform. Well, Moody came, and, and, and when it was his time to speak, he stepped up to the edge of the platform. He looked directly at the students gathered there, and he shouted, Young gentlemen, don't ever think God don't love you, for he do. That's what he said. And all of a sudden, they were dumbfounded. I mean, they froze. They said it was so quiet. You know, the proverbial pen, they were just quiet and looking at him. And then he went on with his sermon for a few minutes, and, and he said it again. Young gentlemen, don't ever think God don't love you, for he do. And it, it just overtook them. They couldn't even respond to what he was saying. Something about, obviously the Holy Spirit, but something about the very improper structure of his words Captured all of them, captured all their intelligence, captured all their culture, and got them right where God wanted them to be. The intense honesty of D.L. Moody spoke directly to their hearts beyond all the superficial external things that they thought were important. You know, all these things that we build up. A great, great revival then began through D.L. Moody, a Moody, Moody, a humble servant of God in England, an American backwoods preacher. If God can do that through him, what can he do through you? Why is God against the wisdom of the world? Most of it's about our bragging, our boasting, you know. First Corinthians one twenty nine, So that no one may boast before him. Boasting, bragging, showing off, gloating. We're all experts of this. We don't even know it. You know, we don't even know it. That's the reason God doesn't want to do things our way, because it's based on an illusion 
Our way is based on illusion, but God Almighty is a realist. Because he is reality. When we boast in ourselves and in our own abilities, we are confessing that we have the power on our own to succeed. And God knows that's a lie. We should know that, and we do. We have moments of understanding that, but we forget. We forget. It's a lie. When we brag about our self-generated accomplishments, we are living in a fantasy world. The most gracious, the most loving, the kindest thing that the Lord can do for us is puncture our sin-infested pride, collapse our pedestal of self-importance, and shatter our illusion of self-sufficiency. Because on our own, it ain't going to happen. It is our pride that makes us independent of God. It's appealing to, to our flesh to feel that we are the master of our own own universe our own fate that we run our own lives we call our own shots and you know what we go it alone it's this feeling that it's our most basic dishonesty we cannot go it alone we've done that and how did that work for you it didn't and it never will we not only need god we need other people it's it's fundamentally simple but it's not so easy to live we cannot ultimately rely on ourselves we cannot. As a matter of fact, we are dependent on God for our very next breath. Our very next breath. It makes you stop and think. I hope it does. When we try to live independent of God, we're self-delusional. <laughs> Pride is not just an unfortunate little trait. Oh, that's just the way I am. That's not just an unfortunate little trait. Humility is not this little attractive virtue. Oh, that'd be nice to have a little humility. This is our inner spiritual integrity we're dealing with. It's at stake. Uh, when we are conceited, we are lying to ourselves about who we are. We're pretending to be God and not human. Our pride is the worship of ourselves, and that is the official religion of hell. We think we're God. And I'm not talking about blatant, just even the subtleties in our life where we think, we, we just got, I got this, God. You don't have to worry about it. I got it. No, you don't. If you're here today and you feel worthless or that you can't handle life or that, that you've lost the ability to function, you've got to hear what I'm saying to you. You do have a sense of worth. You do have value. You are, you have a, a sense of confidence if you look deep enough of acceptance, a sense of being and a significant value. It is yours. The world, of course, says that you have to earn it, but God says, I give it to you. I paid the price for it so that you can have it. It is a gift. It is yours already. You are righteous because of Jesus. Live it. Live it. We live it out in holiness. We live it out in redemption is what we sang about a lot yesterday and this morning too. The restoration of something that was useless to something that's now useful because of what Christ did on Calvary. It's the Lord who changes us. He does it all. Not us. Not any of us. It's God. And how did that happen? When Jesus said, follow me, we did. We did. And we did that by confessing him, by repenting of our sins, accepting who he is, and, con and, and confessing him as Lord. Jesus said, follow me, and we did. God wants to use us. Men, women, and children wants to use us to carry out his plan. We're supposed to finish the work that Jesus started. That's our calling. How, and it, it looks a thousand different ways just in this room alone. We're all in ministry. And as we look at ourselves, evaluate our own call, and look what's happened in our lives, we can clearly see not many of us by human standards are wise or, or influential or born you know, high society or nobility. We are not many. And I love that about God. So God didn't say, not any of you. God said, not many of you. Our salvation is engraved with the letter M. And I want to publicly thank God for that in the name of Jesus Christ.